Good evening. I'd like to call to order today, Monday, February 6, public hearing, uh, 2023 public hearing for the City of Tampa's Architectural Review Commission. Welcome. I'm Susan Claus Smith. I am the chair of the commission and I'm also an architect. If you're here to present a project, you will have limited time to make your presentation, so we suggest being thorough but concise. When coming to the microphone, you will need to identify yourself and your relationship to the project. The commissioners will not ask any questions during your presentation and your, pro and your project should be presented in the following order. The site plan, the elevations, architectural details, and wall sections. Then the staff will present the staff report and we will then ask for public comment. Following your presentation, the commissioners will be asking questions in the same order as the presentation. When coming to the microphone, please state and spell your name clearly if you are here to speak for or against a project. Your time will be limited to three minutes, so take some time now to summarize your comments because three minutes goes by very quickly. Following the public comment, the applicant will have five minutes for rebuttal. The public hearing will then be closed and the only comments which will be allowed after the public hearing is closed will be in response to any questions from the commissioners. The commissioners will then discuss the case and will make their decision based on the city ordinance, chapter 27 of the city zoning code, excuse me, the design guidelines, the Secretary of Interior Standards, Historic Preservation Development Review, or HPDRC comments, and the testimony given here tonight at the public hearing. Please note that the ARC can only act on items that are within our specific jurisdictional responsibility. Owners and or agents are independently responsible to obtain any appropriate permits and or approvals. Now, if you haven't already done so, please do silence your cell phones. And I'm going to ask my fellow commissioners to introduce themselves, starting on my right. Well, I'm Dan Brokoff. I'm a practice architect. Dan Myers. I am an architect. Good evening. My name is Stephen Sutton. I also am a registered architect. I also hold the architectural historian chair for this commission. And with us tonight, we have Dennis Fernandez, Ron Vila, Elaine Lund, um, Yeah, I know Alexis, I'm trying to remember. It's Dana. Dana, it's not on here and I forgot your name, I'm so sorry. Dana and uh, Alexis Guzman. And then we also have someone with the city that, did Dave you want I'm sorry? Dave Jennings. Dave Jennings with the city planning department. Minutes? Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm. And, the first thing on our agenda tonight is the um, reading and approval of the minutes of January 9th and 11th for 2023. If there are no comments, we can, enter, we can enter those into the record with a motion. I move that the Architectural Review Commission public hearing minutes for Monday, January 9th, 2023, and for Wednesday, January 11th, 2023, be approved as presented. I second the motion. All in favor, please state aye and raise your hand indicating so. Aye. aye. Motion carries. Mr. Fernandez. Good evening, Commissioners. Dennis Fernandez, Architecture Review and Historic Preservation Manager. A couple uh, points of interest for this uh, evening's meeting. I do have the uh, January 2023 ARC staff approvals to enter into the record. Uh, those are provided in the packet as well. Um, we will, uh, I think, before the close of the meeting, uh, just have a motion to accept all the documents you received and filed during the meeting. Uh, that way we'll catch everything at one time. Uh, secondly, I did want to announce that we will not be holding a uh, public hearing on February the 8th. Uh, we are handling all of the February uh, applications during tonight's hearing. And uh, that is a nice relief because I know the board's been very busy for quite a few months having two hearings a month. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Lastly, uh, I wanted to introduce a new accomplishment and um, preservation expansion that was recently achieved uh, through our division and uh, to which affects you because now you will be uh, in um, the role of monitoring the future applications in this area. So I was going to do just a short PowerPoint uh, before we begin the case review. If I can go to the PowerPoint, thank you. Wanted to uh, introduce you to a recent expansion of the boundaries of the Hyde Park Local Historic District. 
Uh, this occurred just uh, a few weeks ago, was finalized, but has been an effort that's been underway for a couple years with our staff in its role as the Historic Preservation Commission staff. Just to give you a little background, the Hyde Park uh, Historic District, indicated in the map, which you know very well, was established uh, first as a National Register District in 1985. That's indicated by the blue line that are, it is on this map. And then uh, uh, three years later in 1988, it was established as a local historic district. Uh, the uh, classifications of buildings uh, is uh, today 834 contributing structures and 433 non-contributing structures for a total of 1,267 structures. At the request of the neighborhood associations at the northern part of the district, the Hi uh, Historic Hyde Park Neighbor Neighborhood Association and the Hyde Park Spanish Town Creek Civic Association, uh, applications were submitted by those organizations for the city along with the Historic Preservation Commission to consider the expansion of the local historic district in order to protect structures uh, within the neighborhood that were being um, essentially either uh, inappropriately modified or torn down. So the process under 27256 is very extensive. It involves uh, periods of research, public outreach, and then of course the consideration of the eligibility of the uh, area by both the Historic Preservation Commission and uh, Tampa City Council. Uh, as you can kind of see from the dates, roughly we, we began this in uh, 2021 with an official application, but we were engaged uh, with the neighborhood going back into 219 and sort of with a hyphen of the pandemic, which kind of slowed us down a little bit there. Um, but uh, there, the, the process within 27256 does call for the staff to conduct research and community outreach, which there was a, a great deal of that. And we were certainly bolstered by the efforts of the neighborhood associations who really took on the, the heavy lifting with education and outreach of, of the residents in the area. Uh, we had several meetings with the Historic Preservation Commission which were all publicly noticed. Uh, property owners participated in that discussion and the boundaries were somewhat um, identified and, and, and worked through to uh, have the most effect. I'll show you a map in a minute that just kind of explains that. Um, once the official recommendation by the Historic Preservation Commission was made in August of uh, 2022, the Planning Commission uh, staff reviewed the request and found it to be consistent with the Tampa Com Comprehensive Plan it then went to two public hearings, uh, one in late December and one just at the beginning of this year, at which City Council uh, unanimously approved the expansion. So the uh, study area essentially constituted the area north of the existing local historic district boundary line, which is indicated in this uh, map on the red line, and then really encompassed everything uh, south of the uh, Selman Crosstown Expressway. Looking at the historic map, it's interesting because the Summon Cross, uh, Crosstown does not exist in this map, just the, uh, the railway line, but you see uh, our districts kind of superimposed over the area and the consistency of fabric that we see within the existing district and how that was uh, respected uh, as it moved north. The green box is the area known as Dobieville. It's a historic uh, African-American enclave. Uh, that was also incorporated, a portion of it was incorporated into the study area. Dobieville uh, was the, um, is named after Richard Dobie, who was a uh, African-American businessman and philanthropist and entrepreneur. Uh, his house is actually located in the expansion area. It's the house there on the upper right. Uh, so we are very happy to be able to uh, recognize that house and to provide protection for it. Crosstown Expressway, obviously I think we all know uh, what a, a significant boundary line that is to the existing uh, Hyde Park neighborhood. Uh, we looked along that area at the uh, structures that were impacted by both the creation of the, the Crosstown Expressway and by those uh, that are sort of impacted today by its, uh, its existence and the, uh, the entrances and exits that it, it uh, also involves. 
see some of the aerial maps, which are very interesting to look at the area uh, in 1973 prior to the introduction of the Crosstown. And these are some time lapse photos where you see uh, in 75 where you start to see uh, areas being cleared for the Crosstown Expressway. And you see some of that is very close to our boundary lines. And then the introduction of some of the roadways in 1976. And then in 1980 when it began to be operate, operating. And this is a 20 more contemporary 2020 map which shows uh, more of the configuration of how it is today. In the examination of the area, uh, the area was looked at as a whole and then uh, through the various discussions with the Historic Preservation Commission and the neighborhood associations, uh, areas were sort of um, focused upon and evaluated uh, independently. In the final version, which brought the um, northern boundary to the center line of Platt, which is consistent with the existing northern boundary of the local historic district. Uh, we were able to add 84 contributing structures and 100 non-contributing structures for a total of 184 structures. That area in itself constituted 46% uh, contributing ratio um, status. However, when merged with uh, the existing um, inventory, it uh, still results in a 63% contributing status ratio, which is very substantial. You'll see uh, some similar architectural styles that we have in the district today, but also some unique styles, such as a neoclassic, uh, Spanish eclectic, uh, uh, shotgun style houses and early Florida vernaculars, along with some Mediterra Mediterranean revival. So through the process, the staff uh, evaluated the area in accordance with uh, chapter uh, 27, the eligibility criteria. We found similar to the local historic district that it qualified in three different areas uh, with associations to significant events with the early development of the city of Tampa and, and its uh, neighborhoods, which associated persons, which there's a number of significant <coughs> individuals uh, that composed uh, the uh, pioneer families of um, Hyde Park and this area, including, as I said, Richard C. Doby, uh, Peter O'Knight, and many of the original developers of the neighborhood parcels. And then uh, the area also does embody a distinctive characteristic and represents masters of a type of work that possesses significant architectural value. That is the architectural significance, which I think we can all uh, understand, particularly in your role. So you see the revised boundary map, which uh, shows a more uh, unified northern boundary along the center line of Platt Street. Uh, on August 30th, as I had mentioned, the Historic Pre Preservation Commission voted to recommend approval of this expansion to the uh, city council. And uh, that was consistent with the request of the both neighborhood associations. As I mentioned, it was found to be consistent with the Tampa Comprehensive Plan, which is essential with these types of designations, and was adopted uh, on January 5th uh, by Ordinance 2023-16, uh, thus uh, expanding the district boundaries and placing these additional structures under uh, the ARC's jurisdiction for exterior modifications, new construction, uh, much of the same types of uh, applications that you, you're gonna be reviewing this evening. Uh, that concludes my overview, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Any questions? None. No. Well, thank you. Thank we'll you for we'll very move thorough. On. Mr. Sutton? I just had a general question. Uh, you, of course, this uh, evaluation has a, uh, a running inventory of contributing and non-contributing structures. Do you have a handle uh, 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 as to the number of vacant or under uh, unimproved lots? Uh, I don't, you know, I didn't calculate that necessarily within the data. We, we the, the calculations we use are contributing or non-contributing structures. Uh, I can tell you that just out of familiarity with the neighborhood, 
there's very few vacant or unimproved lots in this area. Uh, most of them are uh, either uh, owner occupied or, or being um, rented. There's just the land value is, is, is very high. That was one of the reasons that the neighborhoods were very interested in providing the protections of the local historic district to this portion of Hyde Park because they are experienced, they were experiencing a number of demolitions and loss of their historic fabric and, and their character. Thank you very much, sir. Sure. Thank you again for a very interesting and detailed presentation. With that, I think we are uh, now at the point where we will uh, disclose conflicts of interest in ex parte communication and our legal counsel, Ms. Crosby Collier, will uh, lead that discussion. of interest with regard to any item that's on the agenda tonight? I have none. No. None. None. Thank you. Has any member engaged in any ex parte communication with regard to any item on the agenda tonight? I have not. No. None. Thank you so much. Thank you. With that, uh, we do have one continuation. I'll go ahead and handle that. Uh, it is uh, for the property located at 410 East Forest Avenue under case number ARC 23-69. The agent has requested a continuance until the April 3rd, 2023 public hearing to prepare their documents. Get a motion, please. I move to continue ARC 23-69 at 410 East Forest Avenue um, to the April 3rd, 2023 public hearing. I have a second. I second the motion. All in, all in favor, please state aye and raise your hand in between. So aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. We're now ready for our swearing. Uh, anyone in the audience who's going to be presenting or providing any sort of testimony this evening, if you keys, could please stand and raise your right hand for Ms. Guzman to swear us in. And with that, we're ready for our first case, and Mr. Vila will introduce that case. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dennis. Good afternoon, commissioners and the public. I'm Ron Beal. I'm staff with Historic Preservation. The first case that we will be reviewing this evening is ARC 21-364. This is for the address of 818 Edison Avenue. This is in the Hyde Park Historic District. The zoning attached to this parcel is RS60. They are coming forward for a request for a certificate of appropriateness for new construction for an accessory structure with site improvements. If you go to page three of the staff report, you see some past action associated with this parcel. It's all associated with the path for the accessory structure. When this one first came in, they were looking to do some renovations to the accessory structure. After a further review, they felt uh, their experts came forward and that the building was compromised that uh, was in uh, the path of demolition. It came in front of this board and the demolition request was denied in 2020-21. Uh, after that, it was appealed to city council. City council overturned the ARC's decision that the structure can be removed. It's currently still there. You'll see some pictures of it through the photo presentation. And tonight they're coming forward for the certificate of appropriateness for the new construction. There's one caveat that's attached to this parcel that it is within the FEMA boundaries. So as it comes forward, there's some FEMA language that must be met as well. Uh, that will be apparent through the drawings and through their uh, professional uh, giving uh, their presentation tonight. And then we also have Mr. Jennings from the city of Tampa to answer any questions if it comes um, at, to that point. So moving forward, I would like to uh, share with you some photos and some uh, past action. On the monitor, we have the 1929 Sanborn map which is highlighted in the green area. It faces Edison. At that time, it had the, the two-story accessory structure in the back. You see the primary structure here. There is an alley that runs north and south behind uh, the parcel. There is not gonna be any alley access associated with this. All the access will come from the primary street. This is an overhead. Uh, you see the property in question is in the green box. It, it is on Edison. As I stated, it still has the open alley to the back. This is the roof line for the primary structure and then the detached two-story accessory structure that did receive approval for demolition. 
This is just to get a, an idea in the vernacular of the primary structure at 818 Edison. This is the front elevation. Moving around to the side, which is the south, you see the vehicular access and the accessory structure in the background. The footprint will be oriented in approximately the same uh, position it's in currently. This is looking at the uh, north elevation and moving around to the rear so you get an understanding of the vernacular of the primary structure. The surrounding area, this is the, the property to the uh, south. Moving to the north and just focusing back on the accessory structure and the approach, there's a gate uh, as you come into the, the secured area. This is the accessory structure that is slated for demolition. This is just a little closer shot as it receives the automobile from the primary street, as I stated. You see the overhangs, the windows, the trim, and the siding here. This is the interior elevation. Some of the vernacular that's currently there. And just to conclude, a couple of alley shots looking at the condition of the alley in both directions. But as I stated, the alley will not be used for access. At this time, I'm going to have the agent uh, address the board. And then after, uh, we have Mr. Jennings and myself to answer any questions as we go into the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Rima. I'll be going through the what's being handed out to you on the overhead <clears throat> so you'll be able to see it but you can follow along um, at your desk I'm Steve Michelini. I'm representing Peter Wu and Alexander Fisher, who are the property owners at 818 Edison. Uh, they purchased their property in 2019. Uh, the original structure was built in 1928. And as Ron pointed out, originally uh, there was a, an attempt by the owners to renovate the existing garage apartment. <clears throat> and after exhaustive uh, studies, uh, testimony by professionals, it was determined that it could not be renovated in its current location. Uh, Tico had a number of issues regarding the proximity of the existing building to the power lines. Uh, we went through that process as well and it was, it was not approved. So anyway, we are here before you now uh, after a little more than two years of trying to figure out how to replace their existing garage apartment. and. Uh, we have concluded uh, with the assistance of city staff for <clears throat> the FEMA regulations uh, officials of the city, um, also the city attorney's office and the uh, ARC staff. And what we see before you is a compilation of how, how we get to where we need to be regarding this property and the replacement of the garage apartment. The issue that is driving this for the most part in terms of design is the FEMA regulations which um, either make you elevate your existing building or you come up with an alternative design which is acceptable to the city um, <clears throat> and the city official who's responsible for that which is Dave Jennings. So we have prepared a plan that meets that criteria and also to the largest extent possible meets the criteria regarding the historic district guidelines. So I want to go through those with you. Um, first, there is the, the site plan. We will be um, demolishing the existing structure and then relocating uh, a new structure that meets the setbacks 
moves it away from the alley, addresses the concerns that Tico had regarding the power lines, and moves it away from the rear, the side property line as well as the rear. It basically is going back in the same place uh, with the adjustments to meet the side yard and rear yard setbacks. This is the first floor plan, which is showing you essentially the same, the proximity of the, of the existing building or the proposed building, which will, again, meet the setbacks, not require variances for that. And it also is showing you the location of the AC unit, the stairs accessing the second level, and basically the four, the four corners of the property. Now we're showing you the second floor. Um, as I said, this is an existing garage apartment and then we were seeking to replace that. Okay, this is the front elevation of, can you see that or is the, or the language jumping in front of you? You can see it, it's in focus. This is the uh, proposed uh, new construction. The, uh, the windows are proposed to be aluminum clad wood windows. The siding is hardy board. The uh, garage doors are an acceptable historic design and they're um, fiberglass doors. And the lighting you see that we have more details on the lighting that's, that's being shown there. The roofing is going to be asphalt shingles and the railings and all that, we have the details that I'll show you in a second. Um, when we get to the other side, this is the only side that's fully enclosed. When we get to the other three sides, we have an alternative in there that we had to uh, design to, in order to comply with the FEMA regulations. Uh, another couple things, these are concrete columns, they're painted. Uh, we have we have vents to, to allow for the water flow uh, in case that that's necessary. Most of these things will have to be dealt with at the staff level and in permitting on the actual design because this is a unique position to be in. This is the first time that a FEMA regulated design has come before this board and it's the first time that we've had to work out a, uh, an alternative reg uh, design that complied with both the ARC and also with, <clears throat> with FEMA. This is the, uh, a view of the rear. This would be the alley side view of, of the garage apartment. Again, aluminum um, clad wood windows, the, the party planking down below, and we have to have two inch spacing between each of those planks, and that's to comply with the the FEMA regulations that indicate that it has to be able to flow through uh, any water or uh, any, anything associated with the flood elevation. Now, uh, we worked with staff regarding the flood elevation and uh, the upper level is clad and, and it was, will not have to have the, uh, the separations, the two inch venting down below. But everything down below is hardy board with two inch separations. Um, I, I went through this a second ago, but the guardrails are all painted and they're vertical, <clears throat> they're vertical slats and the, uh, the air conditioner will sit basically in this area just outside of the stairs. Uh, this is the, uh, this would be the, the south elevation of the property that currently faces uh, a neighboring property. There's a fence, a six foot high fence that's there. 
and it's again it's showing you that on the second floor it'll be fully uh, addressed with the hardy board and showing it as lap board and then down below will be the hardy board with the two inch required slats This is the north elevation. Uh, the north elevation will be on the lower level is completely open. Uh, and again, that's to meet the FEMA requirements regarding flooding. The second level where the, the garage apartment is, is, uh, is the enclosed side. The air conditioner is to be located and, and mounted over here. And again, that will have to be elevated to meet the FEMA regulations. We're showing you the stairs, the inside of the stairs, um, the only, the only portion of that that could be uh, treated in any way for enclosure would be a kick plate to keep someone's foot from falling through the railing and perhaps uh, injuring themselves. The rest of it is completely open. And we're providing you, I don't know if you, you have this in your booklet. Let me try to zoom in a little bit on the wall section. Um, you can see that we're basically providing the concrete columns, wood frame construction, and in the lower level, the hardy board with the, uh, with the slats on the lower level and the fully enclosed areas on the upper level. And this is the second side showing you uh, the wall section again. That's what they're looking at. Yeah. Well, it's it's kind of hard to shift it off there. Showing you the window placement and the walls, <clears throat> and this is the you're seeing the stairs now. This is the detail on the, uh, on the railings and the posts that I spoke about earlier, showing this painted guardrail with vertical <coughs> slats with a four inch spacing. In terms of our material list, we're proposing architectural asphalt shingles, exposed rafter tails that are painted, exterior walls, hardy board with lap <coughs> with a four inch reveal and a smooth finish. The trim is a five and uh, five fourth inch <coughs> hardy board with a 5.5 inch smooth finish, aluminum clad double hung uh, wood windows. And these are specified as Sierra Pacific H3 series. The garage door is overhead garage door courtyard collection uh, 16 by seven model 7560 white with stock bridge windows. The pedestrian door is uh, Plaster Pro recessed two panel door. It's white and lighting, <coughs> progress lighting, flat finished lantern style, chrome finish. Here's a detail. Can you still see that? Yes. Um, yes. This is the detail on the windows. And then we have the specification sheet from the uh, manufacturer. And we're showing you the design guidelines from the courtyard collection. The painted finishes that are available, and we've chosen white. This is the uh, photograph of the proposed garage doors. Two panel door, this would be for the upper level. The uh, carriage style lanterns for the lighting on the front. And then there's a larger view of, of that lantern. And again, you have all of these in your package. We've reviewed everything you have here uh, with the staff. And let me just run through a couple of the criteria that you know, we had to meet regarding FEMA. It had to be reviewed based upon the danger that materials and debris would be swept away and cause some off-site damage. 
the danger of life and property damage due to flooding or erosion. <clears throat> the susceptibility of the proposed development, including contents of flood damage, to the effect that, that such damage would be current or future owners. <clears throat> the importance and services provided by the proposed development to the community, in this case, the property owners, and we've been dealing with, they, they bought this in, uh, in 2019 and have been in the process of review for renovation, restoration, or reconstruction since that time. So we're now in 2023, uh, hoping that you, we received your approval and we can move this on <clears throat> the compatibility of the proposed development with the existing anticipated development, the relationship of the proposed development and com comprehensive to the flood zone management program for the area. We went through an exhaustive review with city staff, with the city attorney's office, and the Hillsborough County Flood Board before we got to this point to come back to you. Uh, the expected heights, uh, velocity, and duration of rate of, of rain, <coughs> rise of debris and sediment based upon flooding. Uh, we believe that we have met both the spirit and the intent of the code for both FEMA and the ARC. Uh, this has been a very delicately proposed uh, solution. It is uh, strategic in its nature, and we also kept in mind with our discussions with the staff that we didn't want to set some kind of precedent for Hyde Park because most of the south uh, and east, um, east sides of Hyde Park are in a flood zone. So we wanted to be very careful about essentially not opening, um, no pun intended, but the, the floodgates for other projects coming before you. But as these other projects do come before you, um, they will have to be meeting the same criteria that we're discussing with you this evening. And we were very cognizant of the fact that we didn't want to cause um, this to become an issue that somebody else would copy without careful consideration. So in that respect, we, we believe that we have met the intent, uh, and in some cases we have met the letter of the code. And what we didn't want to have to do was to try to elevate this structure six feet and try to propose a ramp in the front that would be completely incompatible with the district. It would not be a wise solution um, and we came to the, to the uh, final conclusion, as I said, with, with city staff, um, that this was the best alternative that we could propose. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have, but that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. McElhaney, and now the staff will present the staff report. Good evening, Commissioner Ron Vila, staff with Historic Preservations. Page three of the staff report, under staff's finding is the application is consistent with the Hyde Park design guidelines. We, we review the plans on, that were submitted on January 18, 2023. Uh, with much discussion with multiple departments, we had some conditions associated uh, with that plan, with those plans that were submitted. Uh, a lot of the items were addressed this evening. Just to go through a couple of them, uh, the initial plans that we reviewed had a vinyl window. This evening, they uh, presented a cladded aluminum window. Uh, the original plans showed a fascia that the rafter tails were not exposed. Uh, tonight, they, had, they removed the, the fascia, the rafter tails are exposed, and the overhangs are at 18 inches. The pedestrian door is now detailed. It's a half door. Uh, before, it was just uh, some kind of placeholder before a blank door. And we wanted additional information for the public hearing tonight for, for you to review for the louvers and the railing, um, and they were presented this evening. One item that was on the plans, but it was kind of difficult to see on the interior portion of the uh, elevation, the mechanicals were lifted up, and they are uh, associated with the stairs, so they had to be raised to meet FEMA's requirements as well. Um, other than that, I believe all the other items have been addressed. I'm here to answer any questions along with Dave Jennings with the City of Tampa as well. Thank you, Mr. Vila. We'll now open up the case to public comment. If there's anyone who would like to speak for or against this project at this time, is your opportunity to come forward. Anyone? Seeing no one, we will go ahead and move forward. And the commissioners begin asking questions beginning on my left. Mr. Taylor. Okay. Mr. Sutton. I have two questions, sir. Um, I understand the 
process of, of uh, using that slat work uh, with the op uh, with that two inch opening on uh, the adjoining property side and on the uh, uh, alley side to allow a flow of water through this. Uh, can you educate us as to why that similar um, uh, installation uh, is uh, was not accepted, if you will, uh, on the interior elevation side underneath the stair? You, I would, I would think that you know, if you're going to have a garage storage area, that you'd want to have some manner of security. That, that's really a Dave Jennings question, but let me, let me just tell you from, from our perspective, um, we had discussed a partial enclosure there, um, and I don't want to speak for the staff completely on this issue, but <clears throat> we tried other alternatives, and the general consensus was that we were a allowed to have a fully enclosed door on the garage street side which in our opinion was more important for the visual aspect of Hyde Park uh, than it would be to expose open slats or open uh, viewing of an, of an interior side um, that basically was inside their property line. Uh, but we've had that discussion exhaustively with the building department and Dave sitting as the, as the chief FEMA official and I'll let him explain to you uh, why that can't happen. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Commissioner Chief. I'm Dave Jennings, Construction Services Operations Manager and the City of Tampa's uh, Floodplain Administrator. Uh, when we looked at the structure and based upon the Chapter 5, 111, 247, which is the uh, accessory structure element, which this is, uh, there are compliances with FEMA with, uh, within our ordinance that was outlaw outlined by the State of Florida <clears throat> to us and to FEMA that did not allow for a more than a one-story structure when it lies within an AE, which is Special Flood Hazard Area, or a VE, which is the velocity zone. And this structure, as it stands, is two stories in height. However, the requirement would be the bottom would be a stilted structure and completely hollowed out from underneath, so you just have four columns and a structure above. That is something that discussing with uh, Dennis Fernandez and Mr. Michelini and his clients, we really didn't want to present something to you that was open and completely see-through with the stilted structure. So we worked out to be able to have a garage door on the front, uh, slatted on the side so it still gives the look of being enclosed, but it is not an enclosure below. If they were to enclose that other side where the stairs were, it would be an enclosed structure and it would be in violation of chapter five, chapter five, 111 requirements. And they would have had to seek a variance from the Hillsborough County Flood Board, which is our interlocal agreement for variances to be sought. So in order of keeping one side open, which seemed to be the easiest side, which is on the interior side, where it's less seen by the surrounding properties, that that met the spirit of being a, a structure that is not enclosed. Now, enclosures can be slatted work, louvers, screens. Uh, though all those things would make the structure be an enclosed structure. Uh, so we left one side open so it meets the spirit of being an open area below the, the story above. So it would not be considered two-story. Does that help a little bit? So that screening, uh, so that screening we have on the on those two elevations are really a bonus to the project. I'm Aesthetically, sorry? well, it, it gives they're, you. They're the, a gift. Yeah, they, <laughs> they're it, a it gift. Gives, being that it's slatted, it has some openness. <laughs> we have one side open. That means that it's still not an enclosure, but it does have three sides that have some features on them that present an enclosure. Mm -hmm. But the inside one is completely all open. Thank you very much, sir. Sure. I mean, technically, you know, and I guess ideally for design purposes, we would love to be able to do something there. But as I said, we, we've threaded the needle here in trying to meet both FEMA and the ARC guidelines. Um, and as I said, it was, it was a gift to get the three sides uh, with some treatment and leave the other side open. Uh, our druthers would be to be able to do that, but 
I mean, you know, Dave and his office, they have to justify any alternatives to the FEMA regulations. And if they start justifying too many of these, then it affects the overall uh, flood insurance program for the city. And the objective here is to increase the compatibility of the, of the flood compliant structures so that we increase the credits that are available to the entire city of Tampa regarding anything that's in the flood zone and the flood insurance program. Did I say that correctly, Dave? You said that <laughs> He's been practicing. <laughs> well, we've had these meetings. I mean, I, I can tell you, we, we have had more meetings than you can imagine to try to get to this point. And so it has been uh, very fruitful, it, but it's been exhaustive in, in terms of how do we get to where we need to be and what latitude does Dave and his office have. Um, and I think that we have come up with the best possible solution that, that blends both the ARC and the FEMA regulations. And again, I said I wanted to be very careful about this because you're going to have more of these coming forward. And uh, we didn't want to, to make it so onerous that you couldn't get to some solution. Well, sir, I'm also looking at this as an opportunity to educate the board as well. You know, as, as you mentioned, this is not the last. I have one more small technical question. Yes, sir. Uh, you handed off to us this evening a, uh, a very welcome and formidable handout respecting the design of the project. There's one element that, that I want to ask you about. Have you all selected or planned something in, or have something in mind for door hardware? I thought we had, we had some door hardware. We were, we were planning to deal with that at the staff level. I can understand that. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Myers? Um, there is a note on page five that says that, the, uh, that you were required 400 square feet of vent. Yes, sir. So that means that you need 400 square, 400 square feet of open space below that uh, below the flood elevation. Below the flood elevation. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So that is so, and so obviously, it, one one uh, one side open and the others two sides slatted, and your garage door also has has flood vents. Has lower level flood vents. Yes. So sir. that so that's how you that's how you met that four hundred. That's why I said we've threaded the needle here. Mm -hmm. um, we've been very careful with this, um, and again, that's. It's it's not it has it's been a very long process, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, we're happy to be here this evening and requesting your approval. Mr. Jennings, can you tell me how you determine that 400 square foot? Is it you know it's basically a 400 square foot building footprint rather? Um, the the FEMA requirements is one square inch for every one square foot of structure. So being 400 square feet of a structure in the down, downsize would be 400 square inches of opened area, which from the base flood elevation to the DFE on the open side will give you that entire length of a 20, 20 foot long garage. You're gonna get that, those square inches needed along with it being required on at least one other side. The slats or the garage door would give you those vented requirements in the in the ground level to meet your 400. Okay, so it's really 400 square inches, inches rather than square feet as it says on the... That's correct. Okay, so there's an error in the drawing, but okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Myers? No further questions, thank you. Mr. Prokop. Um, I have another technical question. The uh, gable vent is that operable or is that blanked out? We haven't determined it. Okay. Do you, would you like it to be operable? Um, I don't know how you're proposing to ventilate and all of that. So that's something that your design team needs to work out. But I just, that was my question. Is it operable? No, as I, again, we, we have a number of, of very technical issues to work out with staff because this is this has not been an easy project to design. 
Um, and so we're requesting that anything that you have questions about that we allow the staff to work that out because we have to go between Ron and Dennis in their office and Dave in his office to try to blend and, and meld this in a, in a way that's acceptable. I understood. Um, you have in the drawings on, I'm looking at page eight right now, there are brackets on either end. Um, in the original structure, were there brackets on that? Because I don't see brackets on the primary structure. I'm just wondering where the bracket idea came from. Did you have, Ron, could you still have those old pictures? I believe there were. There, there were, they're on the back. They're on, I think and the original pictures of the existing garage. That's where I was asking Ron to pull that, those pictures up. She has to talk to the mic if she's going to talk. Oh. Yeah. This is Celeste Perry. Hey. Hi. She's the Hi. architect and she has been sworn. So yes, those were we were trying just to to follow the brackets on the original. Are they usable at all? Can you reuse any of that? Oh, I don't know. When whenever and we understand why the demolition is happening right. and and it came before us and we had I'm sure a, a lot of discussion around keeping it. But of course, anytime there's an opportunity um, to reuse historic components, if you're trying to reconstruct it anyway, you know, um, if there could be any consideration for any component from the original, if it's not completely gone and hauled off already, um, that would be best in terms of maintaining some of that connectivity back sure. and also for the property as a whole. So, I, I don't see a reason why we couldn't salvage that. Okay, the contractor is giving the me a look. The contractor is giving you <laughs> a pained look. <laughs> well, we, we went through part of that. Um, discussion about salvaging what we could that made sense but what you're not seeing here is um, the building is leaning at about a 30 degree angle mm -hmm. and uh, it's already been declared as uninhabitable and in danger of collapse so it's just being held up by bracing um, one of the things that our demolition contractor and we talked about salvaging materials was it it wasn't safe for them to get up and try to salvage um, anything on the beyond the first level but if it's possible I mean I don't I don't think anybody's objecting to, to salvage but if we can do that we will it just is a, a very dangerous situation right now appreciate that thank you thank you for your answer well, um, any other questions yeah, I, had, I had one further question we could keep that photograph back up there Dennis um, now that we're looking at this elevation the um, it's always advisable when um, when building new to not actually duplicate the existing historic stuff to, to, to change it somewhat so it doesn't people don't confuse it with the old historic piece and it doesn't it's not like a replica of it um, but it it would be appearing new while still compatible the other question I had is is the guttering on the adjacent property side needed for water sheeting onto a neighbor's property at all? Well, you're, you're asking me to change hats and I'll be happy to do that. You're not allowed to, to drain water onto any adjacent property and that's right. in, included in the technical standards of the stormwater uh, manual. So the guttering is there. What we're gonna be doing is moving the building away from that side yard so we'll have more room. Um, <clears throat> currently, there's a sidewalk and a little bit of a, of a concrete dam on this side, on the, uh, the south side of that property okay. that you're not seeing. So we had water coming down the driveway and flowing in between these two buildings, and they created a, basically a, 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 a slough to allow the water to come down there. Okay. The gutter is designed to take that water away from there so that it didn't impact the adjacent property. Okay. I have no other questions. Any other questions of the applicant at this time? No? You have five minutes for rebuttal, Mr. McElhaney. I, I think we're fine unless you, you know, I haven't addressed something. I think that we've tried to include everything possible 
And again, we certainly would like to thank the staff for working with us so diligently on this. It's, it's been over two years in this process, and uh, I think we've come up with the best possible alternative. Uh, as I said, blending what we're allowed to do regarding FEMA, what we're required to do regarding the building department, and to try to meet the design guidelines as established in the Hyde Park overlay. So we would greatly appreciate your assistance in, in approving this and any technical issues regarding that are remaining to defer them and allow the staff to make those decisions. So we, with that, I'd respectfully request your approval. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. We'll now uh, close the public hearing and discuss the case. Any points for consideration or discussion? The only statement I can make is I think this is um, um, a um, well-developed small project, particularly respecting the, the variety of constraints that you have on the site as well as meeting other regulations that we don't normally see uh, with respect to works here at this commission. Um, I think you've done, uh, and your, uh, your design team have done quite an admirable job. Um, in terms of, uh, of anything that, that is left open, uh, that I only have three items on my, on my list uh, with, for staff coordination. That's the, uh, the final design and nature of the gable vents, uh, the final selection of door hardware, and the final disposition of the appearance technically and aesthetically for those garage vents, garage door vents. Agreed. And I have nothing else on my hit list. I'm sorry, but I didn't hear your first request. We'll, we will put, if we put a motion forward, we will put in conditions okay. if we do it with conditions. Um, any other thoughts? I think we've discussed previously that we don't have any control over those vents, uh, the, the uh, FEMA vents in the garage door. We don't have control over them. And there are limited um, options on the market currently, but some still look better, better than, than others. others. And the free, the free area space that we talked about earlier that Mr. Jennings talked about, the 400 inches squared, again, a lot of that's gonna be taken over by the fact that they have the slatted, the, the openings between the slats and then the larger open area. Um, so <laughs> thankfully, the vents will be much smaller than we might see in another building that has a complete, you know, enclosure. Um, but you're right, they're very limited and, but hopefully staff will pick the best one. <laughs> or at least ones that work. Um, any other thoughts, consideration? I do think that um, having worked in projects with uh, flood, uh, zoning overlays and major projects. Um, it is a difficult thing to grapple with and how it affects aesthetics. Of course, when you work on a larger project, it's much easier to hide some of it than it is on a small project like this. And I do commend the team for looking at options with staff, with city staff, Mr. Jennings and his staff in particular, um, being able to find some ways to work with that from an aesthetic standpoint that you know, I feel is, is, is headed in the right direction, if not, not there already. So I, I do wanna commend you as well. So is anyone willing to entertain a motion at this point? Um, move to grant a certificate of appropriateness for the drawings and documents presented at this public hearing in ARC 21-364 for the property located at 818 South Edison Avenue uh, with the following conditions. That the uh, professionals co uh, coordinate the gable vents, the door hardware, and the FEMA vents in the garage, do garage door with staff. <laughs> Because based upon the finding of fact, the proposed project is consistent with the Hyde Park design gu guidelines of the city of Tampa for the following reasons. Uh, 
uh, its height and width, its massing and building form, and the materials used are all consistent with those used in the district. I have a second. I'll second. Before we vote, do you understand Mikalini the conditions put forth here tonight? Yes, yes. Chair, I understand. I, 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 I'm I sorry, I met Mr. Mikalini. That's fine. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I, I'm called a lot of things. But, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we appreciate that. And, and, I, and again, just before you finally vote on this, I can't tell you how much we appreciate the staff for working with us. Uh, it's been a very long process. And Dave Jennings has gone to extraordinary lengths to try to figure out how do we accommodate both codes, and including the building code, I guess the three codes. So um, we're happy to be here, and thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. Um, all in favor, please state aye and raise your hand indicating so. Aye. aye. No votes. It carries. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Congratulations. Good luck. Um, commissioners, the next item on our agenda this evening is case number ARC 22-362 for the property located at 2303 North Jefferson Street in the Tampa Heights Historic District. This application is for um, a certificate of appropriateness for new construction of a single-family residence with site improvements. You've seen this property um, Previously, it came to you last year for a rezoning recommendation from, uh, to rezone from RM24 to a PD, which was uh, approved for recommend, recommended for approval by this board and then was subsequently approved by city council. Um, this item has been continued, um, I believe, from the January public hearing to um, for the applicant to be able to make some additional changes to the drawings and he is here tonight to present those to you but first we will go through the photo presentation um, looking at the map of the tampa heights historic district here you can see the red arrow pointing to the location of the subject property in green um, it's on north jefferson street just a couple of blocks south of the Tampa Heights Elementary School. And here you can see um, the site highlighted in green when there was a structure on it back in the 1920s. There was a one-story wood frame house that sat on the property at that time. This is the present day aerial of the site, again on the east side of Jefferson Street between Francis Avenue and Amelia Avenue. And note compared to the, uh, the properties along those other streets like Amelia and uh, Francis that it is a, um, a rather small parcel. This is looking at the site, we're looking east into it from Jefferson Street. This is the parcel directly to the north. And this is the parcel directly to the south. Um, this is at the corner of Francis and Jefferson. And then looking across the street to the west, we see another vacant lot. This is looking north along Jefferson Street. And this is the view to the south along Jefferson Street. So at this time, I'll ask the applicant to come forward and present his request. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Beckwith. I'm the property owner. As um, <clears throat> Elaine mentioned, you guys have seen this once before. So we'll start with the, the site plan. So this property is actually very small. It's only 35 feet wide and 57 feet deep. So through the rezoning process, the uh, setbacks were approved. As you can read on here, they're very small. There's seven in the front, 11 in the back, three on one side and five on the other. Um, the challenge with this property was getting two parking spots on there. 
in such a small area. Um, one of the things you'll see that was we flipped the we flipped the lot, put the driveway on the other side to accommodate for the tree, to leave that tree in the front. There were some trees removed from on this property from the previous owner illegally, but <clears throat> anyway, that was something I had to pay for. Um, so we made a couple changes from the previous plans. Tried to make more alignment with the windows suggested by you guys. Uh, changed, I'll get to when I, when I show you the floor plan, the, uh, there was a step that was inside that kind of carport area to the side, so we got rid of that. You'll see that the door is now in the back. Um, and then, so there, there'll be a step towards the, uh, towards the front door there. <clears throat> so the rear, rear elevation, you can see there, there's now a door on the back where it was on the, on the side before. And on the side elevations, again, there was some discussion about windows and alignment. Um, some of the smaller ones are because they're on stairs or they're in a bathroom, but we've got them more consistent in a line. Same thing on the other side of the house as well. On the floor plan, Mainly the first floor was, again, you can see where the, uh, the door is in the rear now instead of on the side. So there's no step inside that carport area at all. If I, you know, I can do a step on, you'll see a small step on the side of the front porch. You see that first line there, but it's inside the, the, the you know, the, the line of the house on the left-hand side. It's basically behind that column right there. So it doesn't protrude into the carport. And also, we changed the depth of the front porch to six feet. It was just under, just under five before. So we just try, again. It's a very small house, but we just went ahead and added that area to the front porch. <clears throat> as far as the materials, simple. Go through this again. The uh, asphalt shingles on the on the roof. open rafter tails. Um, there are some small brackets. They don't match these, but they're on, they're on the plan. I can go back to that. They're just an eight by eight bracket that we can look again at the elevations. The columns, these details are on the, on the prints as well. If I need to shrink this down here. That's what the upper part of the columns look like. The house is all party board siding. This uh, example of a tongue and groove ceiling, which will be on the front porch. This picture actually gives a good uh, view of the column. The brick actually shows the tongue and groove ceiling and the, uh, the wood porch that will be the front porch. This is an example of the foundation by doing a, a clad brick to give the, the look of the pier type foundation. And again, the hardy board siding. <clears throat> this is an example of what the windows will look like, the three over one. This is just an example of the, of the grids on the outside of the window. This isn't the actual window, but just gives you an idea of the, how the grids are on the external part of the window. This is what the actual window looks like. It's a Viwinco double hung window. It's an example of what the front door will look like. The 
door hardware. And a coach light. Should be one on the front and one on the back. This is the wall section. This is actually across the front porch of the house. So the second floor of the house is, uh, is wood frame. And the first floor is block. I don't know if you guys want to see anything specific on this that I need to go to, but just shows the window locations. Uh, again, shows the tongue and groove on the porch ceiling. And that concludes my presentation. Great, thank you. We'll move on to the staff report. Ms. Lund. Thank you. Um, Elaine Lund, Historic Preservation Staff. Staff finds this application is consistent with the Tampa Heights design guidelines. Uh, we worked with the applicant um, on this project, particularly after hearing some of the comments from the last time he was here at the ARC hearing. Um, there are some details that may still need a little bit of refining, such as the, uh, the brick that was selected for the front porch columns, and we are happy to work with the applicant on that as we move along. Otherwise, I have no other comments, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. We'll go ahead and open up the hearing to the public comment phase. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to come forward to speak for or against the project, you may do so at this time. Seeing no one, we'll go ahead and move forward to commissioner's questions. So starting on my right this time, Mr. Prokop. I have no questions at this time. Mr. Myers. Can we take a look at, please, the detail on the windows? The detail of the, the, the pictures of them or on the, on the, uh, the section, the wall section? The wall section. One of the things that we that we usually request is that the window be inset to the inside of the wall plane instead of at the exterior. Would okay. you be willing to Would you be willing to do that? Um, I mean, that's easy to do on the block walls. Mm -hmm. Not so easy to do on the frame walls because of the windows. You know, these days they're on a they're they're a thin window. They're made mm -hmm. to go right on the outside of the plywood, and mm -hmm. then it's all sealed up from there. By trying to inset them, you have to reframe that differently, which can create some issues. Um, this was discussed once before, so I can show you, I mean, that window right there is not inset. That when win those windows right there are not inset. I, I'm assuming you, these are windows from the from the from the area is this yeah. correct these are all new construction homes in the neighborhood that's why i was i was curious when that came up before because mm -hmm. i haven't seen any other builders do it that way all these that's a that's a brand new house mm -hmm. All right, my, my next question so has to do with the... I can uh, do it on the first... I mean, it's easy to do on the block walls. Mm -hmm. Typically, we always do. I mean, there's actually... I didn't take a picture of it. There's a house down the street, new construction. He brought them all out with the block walls. It's literally right down the road. Okay. <laughs> and then... So, to your question, it's... You can frame an opening, right? And then you say you got a two-by-six wall. Then you frame it with a two-by-four inside so that you can still use that thin window but then it creates how do you it's not it's not made to be done that way so how do you seal it we have to go back to a block opening wall inside that that two by four area and kind of the same thing you're not using stucco you gotta you know you gotta really make sure somehow you seal that because mm -hmm. that that thin window is not designed to be pushed back into that wall 
So it's easier to, I, it's hard to explain, but. No, uh, no, I understand your point. Okay. Um, and then looking at the front door, can we, now I'd like to look at the plan quickly. The floor plan? Yeah. And this is this is just a suggestion, but you have, you've you've recessed that step into the kind of into the body of the porch, right? The first step, yes. That yeah, works, the, the step from the from the uh, port cocher, your parking area, right? Right. So then those people are going to have to walk all the way across the other to the other side of the door before they can get in. They have to walk around the door. See what I'm. Change the swing. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. <laughs> And then the wood on the, using a wood floor right yes. for that garage. Um, this is, and this is a very, this, I happen to believe this is a very nice project and it's, and you've like, you have shoehorned this thing on there, right? And you've got this great porch and then I'm just a little bit worried about this, the wood decking that you showed us that seems to be, you know, it's got a lot of knots and stuff in it. It's, um, I've done it on a lot of houses using a two by six, mm -hmm. but I'll only do it under a covered porch because it's not exposed to the sun as much. So. And this is looking west, right? It is looking west, yeah. So I'll get that. This one might get a little more. <laughs> <laughs> what would you suggest? I mean, well, do you guys allow, do you guys allow like Trex decking and stuff like that on porches? Now I'm, now I'm looking at my fellow commissioners. I guess we'll have to hash this one out. Okay. I'm happy to do whatever, whatever you will approve. <laughs> okay. Thank you, no, more, no further questions. Thanks. Mr. Sutton. I have no question. Mr. Taylor. I just wanna verify on the steps that they are, or, or what is the material? Is it, is it concrete? No, it's wood. So it would be, it would be, be part of that well. wood front porch because okay. the elevation from the portico to the, to the front door is almost 18 inches. So you got okay. 14. So it would, be, it would be one one wood step. And then on the windows, there was a lot of talk there about the fins, but wouldn't you agree there's other options? I mean, I can, I can explore it with my window guys to see. I just want to make sure it's going to be sealed properly. Okay. Again, I just... I haven't seen any other houses done that way, so I was curious how, I know you guys like it that way, but I'm, where's the solution to this? What, how, do you, how do we do it and get that window back in the wall? Especially when the second floor is only a two by four wall. And I appreciate you bringing that up because maybe that's something that we can ask later at another time and figure out what's going on there. Right. Um, the trim around the windows and doors, is, are you using five quarter or four quarter? Five quarter. Um, and there is a detail on the elevation page that shows the windows, the doors, the columns, and actually the bracket, the one, again, real small house. We didn't want to put too many big features on it. So the, the brackets in a couple of places are just an eight by eight coming out like a wood beam into the, into the fascia. And the only other question I've got is I, I recognize the size of this home as a contractor myself, I kind of understand some of the design and where things are left out or not, you know, whatever. Uh, but on the, the stem wall itself, I noticed you're gonna use a uh, brick paver, it looks like, to replicate a pier. Was there any thought to maybe stepping that block work a little bit so that those piers, you might could use some, some corner pavers as well just to really accent that or or no um there wasn't any thought to doing that no it's it's a possibility um you know i'm doing another house right now that's the pictures i showed you um again looking at you know other houses in the neighborhood new construction so, <laughs> and I recognize that are you we all, are, are we all following the same rules? You are giving 
us a little more, and that's not going unrecognized. Okay. Um, so again, I just I'm just asking questions so that when we go into discussion, we have something to discuss. Understood. That's all. I was trying to do what was suggested to me before, as far as trying to show some sort yep. of peer type and of foundation. I think you've done a good job of getting to this point. Thank you. I may have asked this question the last time you were in front of us, but I have to ask it again. Are there ceiling fans? Are there ceiling fans? On the front porch. You had it in your image. We right? did. Okay. I'm asking, are there ceiling fans in this project? We on haven't the really porch? done the electrical plan, but I can put them on there. I'm so, not I mean, telling you to put them on. I'm asking, do you have them in your project at this time on the front porch? Typically, no, because it's the distance is so small. So you got six feet. So is it a yes or no? No. Okay. Because <laughs> I was then going to ask you if you had a cut sheet and all those other things. So. All right. Um, when we talked about the brick cladding, that was one of my questions. Um, I do have a question. If we could put the uh, the site plan and the first floor plan up on the Elmo together, if that's possible, in the same orientation. Get a shot. Site plan. That's, that's pretty good. And then just the first floor plan. Mm, you can good. fold the paper. That's probably going to work. First. Oops. Yep. Can you just bring that down a little bit? Thank you. Um, you had noted in one of the elevations that the rear door would have at least one step, correct? And in neither of the site plan or this first floor plan, is there an indication of a step? Is it truly just one step or is it like a four by four square and then a step? I mean, how do you propose entry exit through that doorway? Um, actually, I don't know because of the elevation. So again, as I noticed, the, the, the the previous owner took out some big trees on this lot. Right. So if I can show you, or Lane, do you have the picture of the front of the lot again? I don't know if you can really tell from this, but so like where the street is, where the sidewalk is. So from the back of the sidewalk, the, the lot starts to just go down. Mm -hmm. And it's... So you're going to have to do some grading anyway. I am, but you I mean in the same You have to figure out your elevations and grade the lot appropriately for... Right. I mean, City of Tampa doesn't that. want you to bring fill in. So, because it came up in the last case too with the gutters, you know, I don't want to cover up the open rafter tails and everything with the gutters, but I might not have a choice here. Especially unless unless I'm, unless I'm able to bring up right. just a little bit of dirt just to the sidewalk level to create, as you said, the grade to bring all the water to the front. Right. I mean, the side setbacks are very small, trying to get any kind of what the city requires for a trench Right. You know. So at this time to be determined, correct? In terms of what's going on at the back door yeah. there and, and as it moves to the grade. Can you can we put it back to the Elmo view, please? Thank you, Dennis. Um, so on I want to talk about the material for the um, car drive. Is it all concrete? The entire mm -hmm. area is concrete. Okay. And then um, score marks, how, how are you thinking about the scoring of the concrete? Um, you know, maybe every 15 feet they might just do a control joint going so across. So pretty typical standard motif, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and then from the front porch, it's just that stair and no stair in the front, because it looks like the site plan still has a stair coming out towards the street and then a, some kind of walkway feature that connects to the driveway yeah i would still do a step in the front so you'd have both yeah okay we just need to make sure we understand that. okay great i have no other questions anyone else nope all right you have five minutes for rebuttal anything that you'd like to add or respond i think we've covered everything time? unless there's anything you're in, anybody has another question about doesn't understand anything that's not working for you, <laughs> so to speak.
think everyone Other than that, I'm done, no. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing and discuss the case. I think he's done an admirable job in utilizing a very, very, very tiny, almost undoable lot. Uh, he's packed an awful lot of house uh, on this small parcel. Uh, to some reasonable effect, for that matter, too. It actually looks like someone's hole. I think the, the readjustment of all the windows and the alignment of all the windows and the elevations, I think that really, that just helped out tremendously. And, and reconsidering the size of those column bases really helped. It's such a tiny little home, a yeah. tiny lot. No, the elevations look drastically improved Thank from you. the last time we saw them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Any other thoughts, consideration, concerns? I do think in terms of some final selections, you know, staff can certainly work with the agent and the owner. I don't think that we have trouble with the composite material on a porch floor, right? <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's don't look at me. We, we should have asked staff because I, I, yeah. We need to open it back up because I can answer, but I don't think it's appropriate for me to answer because it needs to come from staff. Okay. So can we get a motion to reopen the? I move to reopen the public hearing. I have a second. I'll Aye. second. All in favor, please. Aye. Aye. Mr. Fernandez. I'll be brief. Uh, you know, essentially, uh, we encourage uh, natural material on the front porch. We do accommodate synthetic materials in the rear yard. Um, there's other uh, more environmental resistant and friendly materials now in the market or concrete is another option for a porch that's appropriate but but a trucks prod product would not be appropriate on the front all right any other Thank questions you. for staff before we close the public hearing no no all right we'll go ahead and close it again oh wait i'm sorry you get rebuttal once it's reopened Nothing. Again, I've, I've done it with the two by sixes on many houses and it seems to work out just fine. It, only on a, on a covered porch. Yeah. Right. Thank you, sir. We'll close the public hearing again and come back to discussion. It seems like whenever I see a wood porch, I see it painted. I very rarely see a clear wood finish on a, on a, on a porch. And, and up and down the eastern seaboard, through Florida, old Florida, it's a wood porch or a wood exterior deck, it's painted. Yeah. I agree, even though they're held at green tape. Um, True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I would put a, uh, uh, you know, a sand, you can cast some sand in it and make exactly. it slippery, you know, slip resistance and all that kind of stuff. That's one of the major things. It, it, it's hard to do that effectively in a clear coat because you see the sand, yeah. but you don't see it in the paint. Oh. Use the so. shark bite, the glass. Yeah. Um, it, it, How yeah. he wants to finish it in his I would, business. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor of a, of a wood porch. That, you know, and it's just, it's a maintenance thing, but you know, an exposed wood porch with a good clear finish is. And the is, fact that it's fine. covered really does make a difference in the the longevity of the material as well as its finish. That's, that's his problem or the owner's problem. Right. I'm just responding <laughs> to someone's concern on the right. board. Right. Right. I understand. Um, Can I ask a question? What, what, uh, we what? closed the hearing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, wood porch, that's off the plate. I, uh, okay. Well, it's, it, yeah. Basically, we, uh, it's historically appropriate. From the old, wood porch yeah. is typical in the neighborhood from it, the old it's not, Yeah, it's right. not appropriate. I mean, right. you know, mm -hmm. we, right. we, don't, we don't select <laughs> colors or paint them. Because the maintenance no, we side. No, we don't even tell them to stain it. I right. understand the maintenance side. We all understand the maintenance side. Right. right. He understands the maintenance Correct. side. Correct. Right. And the owner who buys them right. will obviously. Will learn. Eventually will learn. If they don't know, they will learn. They will in three or four years. Any other points of bring, bring uh, the only thing that I have in terms of a coordination issue is whatever is going to happen with that rear door stoop step situation. I agree. Um, the actual, but he did show an elevation, a rear elevation that did have. It had one step. Uh, it had a couple steps and it had a little shed 
roof over the door. Yes, right. I remember seeing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, little shed roof over the door and a couple of steps down. Um, and that's, I mean, it's, it's not in street view, it's not in public view. So even though it's not, we generally ask about the pavement, that kind of thing, and that's right. where my line of questioning was going, is if there is a landing point, what right. is that like? Yeah, it's, it, you know, and, and like, I assume it's going to be the same as the front porch, it's gonna be wood with a couple of wood steps. Maybe, maybe concrete. But in either, okay. in either case, it's something that definitely staff needs to be mindful of as the It, it needs to be inclusive forward. in the, uh, the staff review. Correct. Right afterwards, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. Well, I, I, I have nothing else on that on the list. Yeah. I mean, the doors and windows I don't are either. I think, I think he really took to heart all the comments oh, yes. he gave Absolutely. and really made tremendous, pro I mean, it's, it's a really nice project, and um, it's it's fascinating to me that you tripped over the shotgun concept without even considering it. And now today, looking at the revised plans and the elevations, there's really this feel of a shotgun. It's a two-story shotgun. You don't usually see a two-story, but that whole idea. And, and um, my husband and I were just walking in Ebor City this weekend with family, and we were talking about how we almost bought an old shotgun when we were just moving into the city as you know permanent residents rather than transitory and um just how fun it would have been but also how tight it would have been <laughs> to live in that yeah. um I don't and know. I it's, didn't want to know it. and and yeah. it's it's just it's just great to see that come forward today when we are used to seeing these tremendous and we're having a lot of discussions about micro housing so yeah. well done it's a tight tight lot and I'm sure you'll find someone that's gonna love it mm. so. I, uh, I, I commend them on being able to meet all the different codes and get it on the tight lot Agreed. yeah that's almost impossible Agreed. any other comments or someone willing to bring forth a motion this one's easy <clears throat> I move the grant a certificate Appropriateness for the drawings and documents presented at this public hearing in ARC 22-362 for the property located at 2303 North Jefferson Street in the Tampa Heights Historic District with the following conditions that the applicant coordinate with staff uh, the conditions for the rear door stoop step situation once grading has been determined at that point in time uh, because based upon the finding of that the proposed project is consistent with the Tampa Height Historic Guidelines of the City of Tampa for the following reason, reasons. One, that the massing and building form are appropriate for this dwelling, particularly a small dwelling on a small site. The orientation and site coverage being consistent with the neighborhood. The alignment and rhythm and spacing is consistent with other small buildings in the neighborhood that the trim and the detail are consistent with what is expected within the Tampa Heights Historic District. Can I have a second? I'll second. Before we vote, um, do you understand the conditions put forth tonight in yes. the motion? Okay. Um, all in favor, please state aye and raise your hand indicating so. Aye. The aye. motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you. Good luck. Good evening, Commissioners Ron Vila, staff with Historic Preservation. Moving to our last agenda item, which is ARC 22-501. This is for the address of 1807 West Watchers Avenue. This is in the Hyde Park Historic District. The current zoning is RS60. The request for the certificate of appropriateness is for new construction in addition to the primary structure with site improvements. Some past action on this in um, 2000. This property came forward with a multiple of uh, considerations. Uh, there was some work done to the house at that time, but not everything was exercised as what was approved. And then this came forward in, in uh, December 2022. You reviewed the project. Um, you provided some direction for the applicant to come forward. The applicant has worked diligently on the dialogue that uh, took place that night and you will see the presentation this evening. 
Uh, moving forward with the photo presentation, uh, I'd like to start out with the Sanborn map that's illustrated. Is it on your monitor right now? It is. It is. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, the address is 1807 Watrous, which is the primary street. You have an alley to the rear. You have a, a lot of uh, historic fabric around there, about the same size as the structure that's coming forward today. The Sanborn indicates that it did have a portico share that ran on the east side of the property, which is current today, and shows the footprint uh, established in 1929. This is a, a current overhead showing it on Watrous. You see the street on the front. Property in question is highlighted within the green um, marker, and you see that the roof line of the primary structure, there is a pool in the, in the backyard, and a one-story uh, shed, if you will. This is looking at the primary structure. Uh, this is the front elevation. It has a generous porch, has the pop-up of uh, the second story behind the ridge, that cross ridge of the portico share. You have the vehicular access, and you have, this was part of the 2000 edition. There is a two-foot edition uh, that bumps out into the vehicular uh, corridor. The prior request that came forward, they were adding on into this area uh, that would impede that corridor. Uh, staff was not comfortable with that. Uh, since then, it has been removed. Uh, the, the existing protrusion will remain as it is. This is looking down that corridor and showing how everything kind of works together. This is the east elevation, and then you see the second story kind of popping up from um, the perspective from the street. And once again, just looking at the foundation, looking at the fireplace that you have to deal with when you come down this corridor, you have some proud steps. So kind of everything is in line as it exists today. Going back to the front elevation, you see the uh, second story and then that uh, west elevation, excuse me. This is just looking back at the porch. As I stated, a generous porch. You see some of the materials that are on the columns uh, currently. You see the lap siding, the brackets, the fascia board on the gable end, and the gable vent. This is looking at the house uh, that abuts to the east. This is looking at the west elevation. Uh, once you get behind the fence on that west elevation, they have the mechanicals placed there. With the addition that's proposed, the mechanicals will have to be relocated. This is just looking at that generous side yard. Usually in, in High Park, you don't have that. They are bumping out uh, to the seven side yard setback. They are not asking for any variances coming forward. This is just looking at that second story and the first story, how it kind of plays together on that west elevation. You see the windows. Uh, once again, you see the lap siding. You see the... Uh, uh, exposed rafter tails and the window casings. This is the abutting structure, which is a contributing structure on that west uh, property line. Going to the rear elevation. And the last photo that I have is showing the remainder of the uh, parcel. As you look at the end of the uh, rear elevation, you have the deck. What we're trying to capture is that continues, and then you have some of the other amenities. You have the uh, pool, a little bit of a backyard, and then that shed. That concludes the photo presentation, and the agent will address the board at this time. Thank you, Mr. Beaver. Good evening, everyone. My name is Francine Masano, and I represent uh, GM Construction. First, we will go over the site plan. So with our first presentation that was done in December before the project was continued, there were some um, quite a few recommendations, and I'd like to address each one of those recommendations. First of all, uh, one of the major recommendations was the fact that we were going to bump out an additional two feet on the driveway side. Um, we have since removed that, and we are going to keep with the uh, existing condition at that side of the house. Um, we also addressed the driveway. We reconfigure the driveway to completely meet code. We will be infilling with pavers and doing 
uh, three feet um, three feet with infill pavers and three feet with concrete. We will also have a solid concrete pad underneath the port of Cachere. Moving over to the other side of the house, there um, we originally had the one-story addition on this side of the house come out to meet the two-story addition here. And what we did was we did bump it in one foot in order to create some um, fenestration on that side of the house. We added to the back of the house. Uh, we added four feet to the back of the house, and you will see on the roof plan that we also have an additional gable roof at the, at the back of the house because one of the biggest concerns was the fact that the addition, the massing was a little bit too large in relationship to the house. So with, um, with regards to the site plan, those are the things that have changed. So for the elevations, um, I believe there was only one board member that was not here, but I'd like to go over some of the renderings that we did from the last presentation. Um, just to give an example, um, this is the existing house. This is the SketchUp model that was created, and you can see the addition actually is there, but it is very, very difficult to see um, from a six-foot viewing height walking down the street. So as you can see in my notes, in the um, design guidelines say inconspicuous when viewed from the street, and the street view will remain almost entirely unchanged. And I think with this project, and especially with some of the redesign that we did, that that is um, even more true with our redesign. So I did a couple of perspectives. So that was the front. This is the side comparing the, um, the condition as it is now and the condition with the addition on the back. So I also did um, a bit of a um, showing the SketchUp model. There is a lot of foliage, which is pretty common um, in all of the homes in the neighborhood. But what I did was I did a rendering with the foliage removed so you can see here, this is the one story bump out and then the addition is in the back. So um, even, this is the previous design. I did not update the SketchUp model um, due to time, but I do have the current drawings, the construction drawings, which will show all of the things that we have changed in elevation. So moving over to the elevations, this is the existing condition down at the bottom. And our proposed, so the major thing that we have changed is we put a clipped hip roof on the addition. And um, Ron and staff definitely agree that that helped visually reduce the, um, the massing of the addition. Um, let's see. Moving on to the side. This is the existing. And this is the proposed. So in changing, in changing the back of the house and having a gable on the back, that changes the roof condition on the west side of the house. So the clip roof, to, we, we added some brackets in the clipped roof, and this would be the, uh, the look of the elevation. What was discussed in the first hearing was the fact that the board would really like to see something that is not exactly matching. You do want to know that there is some differentiation between what is existing and historic and what is new. So the clipped hip roof really serves two purposes. What it does is it reduces the, um, the appearance of the massing, but also it differentiates between what is the existing historic structure and what the new, uh, the new construction is. This is the existing east side. This is the proposed east side. So we also worked very diligently in order to line up the windows in a more symmetrical way, given that bungalows have a great deal of symmetry. At the rear of the house, what we have now is we have a large gable Again, with the clipped hip roof, 
um, this protrudes outward instead of being just on one plane. And we have a, um, an overhang that is coming out over the doorway about six feet from the, um, the face of the structure. Moving on to the roof plan. The roof plan has definitely gotten a lot more complicated. <laughs> so the only thing that I have to say that we worked very, very hard, your concern was, I'm going to go back to the front elevation and show you what was discovered as I was working on the roof plan. So what happens is, as I said, and I do have a complete building section just in terms of volume, and that'll be the next presentation, the, the next um, paper I show you. The floor to ceiling height within the cockpit area is very low. It's about seven foot three. So we tried to lower the roof as much as possible, but what happens is the condition right here becomes very tricky because we want the new roof to be able to properly dive into the existing cockpit roof in a way that not only looks visually appear appealing, but also functions well and waterproof, you know, with concerns with waterproofing and actually um, being able to construct it. So we moved down the roof height just a little bit. We were two feet over the cockpit, and now it's just slightly lower than that. We've only, I was only really able to lower it about a couple of inches. Um, we'll continue to revisit that as we develop the roof plan with the um, structural engineer, but that was really the only thing that I was not able to greatly reduce or change it in accordance with your recommendations. So just a very, very simple, quick volumetric plan. We have a nine foot floor to ceiling height on the first floor. And as you come up, as I said, the cockpit area is 7.3. And then as you move into the addition, we now at um, approximately eight foot four. So we are able to reduce it a little bit. But as I said, as we go through the structural drawings, um, with the engineer, we will definitely address that and keep the uh, floor to ceiling height as minimal as possible in order not to really exceed, um, you know, go try and keep it well under the two foot distance on the exterior of the new construction with the existing cockpit bridge. We have some details. We have some a real beautiful presentation of the details. This will be the pavers in which we have chosen the screening. So we will relocate the mechanical pretty much in the same location, just move it out a little bit more. The red line indicates the fencing that's going to go all the way around. We have double doors. Uh, going into the side yard from the Portico Share. We have a single gate going into the side yard. Fencing and materials will be your typical, as per code, six foot fence height. And we are looking at um, pressure treated four by four posts, one by eight uh, pressure treated board that's stained. In terms of the gates, this is the gate hardware that we have chosen. The window details, the windows will match existing and they will be aluminum clad wood windows. This is the exterior door leading out onto the back porch and the exterior door hardware and the exterior lighting. So the beadboard beef, soffit um, will be made of the same material that the existing house is, which is the beadboard soffit molding. The bracket details that are on the clip tips, hip roofs on the three gate gables that will be constructed on the addition will have the same dimensions and design as the brackets that are on the front of the house. And that the bracket, as a matter of fact, is not as typical 
as you see on some of the houses because usually this portion of the bracket does, um, it doesn't really extend out, but there is um, typically something on the fascia or the, um, in kind of represents the bracket going back, but this house does not have that. So we are going to replicate the condition as from the existing house. Roof material, uh, dimensional shingles, foundation details. Um, this house happens to have an enclosed foundation with stucco, so we will replicate what is on the rest of the house. The exterior wall materials and finish, we um, have the dimensions of the uh, lap siding. It will be four and a half cedar bevel siding. The trim materials, exterior trim, window casing, five inch door casing, top of uh, window casing, five inches, replicating what's on the existing historic structure. The deck materials, we are looking at Kumaru for the front, which is what is on the existing uh, deck right now on the front of the house, and we're gonna be doing that on the back of the house. Exterior door hardware and rear exterior lighting. And then we have a typical wall section. The other consideration, uh, the other concern that uh, you had was the amount of existing structure, especially exterior walls, that were going to be removed. So in the floor plan, the um, I ha still have the demo plan on the uh, existing first floor plan. So this is the only area of existing exterior wall um, of the historic structure that's gonna be removed. This area over here will also be removed, but this was uh, a later, uh, an addition that was put on at a later period. So we are removing some of the existing interior um, wall area in order to be able to get into the addition but this is the only portion of the existing uh, historic structure that will be removed in order to move into the addition. And with that, I conclude my presentation. All right, thank you, staff report. Uh, Mr. Vila. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Commissioner Ron Vila, staff for the historic presentation, preservation. Uh, the presentation was complete and thorough. Uh, we had a considerable amount of bullet items attached to this. Uh, this application is consistent with the Hyde Park design guidelines uh, with the following conditions. After addressing the majority of the items that are on uh, the staff report, just a couple need additional discussion. Is that to revisit the windows, the dimensions on the windows on the east and west elevation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, put on the record that the pavers is, is a transportation direction that they have to provide an additional parking spot that is a fully um, a solid uh, area that is 9 by 18. So she has one car parked under the quarter share and one parked uh, just in front of that for the tandem parking that does meet transportation's requirements now as presented. And then she showed the material selection as well. I want to touch upon the clip gables. Uh, that was one item that we spoke about to find the differentiation between the historic home and the new construction. The clip gables are a very character uh, defining feature for the craftsman style home. The original home does not have that clip gable and I believe that uh, incorporating that into the addition would be period appropriate and part of the overall character of a craftsman style home. So that's the direction that staff felt that was consistent um, with the direction that this project is going. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. We'll go ahead and open this up to public comment. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to come forth and speak for or against the project, you may do so at this time. <laughs> uh, then we'll go ahead and uh, move to commissioners asking questions. And we'll start on my left with Mr. Sutton. Oh, yeah, but I started with him first. Oh, you're just start with me. <laughs> Um, unlike the previous uh, projects that we've seen here tonight, this is a considerably larger one. And I think it, in spite of its, its size, uh, you've gone through a tremendous amount of massaging and reworking and uh, there is an element of a 
appropriateness that I see here. Um, yes, it is a new addition, uh, and I see it as a uh, very compatible addition as well. It is different from the original building. Uh, there's no question of that. Uh, the, the, the election for the use of the rear gable I think is a, 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 an excellent piece uh, for reducing the, the mass that we were concerned about the last mm -hmm. time. Uh, I think that what you've done here, uh, since it is receding, uh, it, is, it, it is in recess to the whole the existing mm -hmm. building, but also with your clipped angles and clipped conditions, uh, uh, increasing that recession really sta brings the forward out. Uh, it, you don't have that big block effect that we had seen previously, and I think this is uh, to the benefit of this whole project. Do we have a question for the applicant? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I know um, you are concerned about the, uh, uh, the height of the roofing element towards the rear, uh, and you're trying to bring that down some more. Have you uh, considered uh, an element uh, or elements of uh, how a um, sloped interior ceiling mm -hmm. might be able to bring down these eave lines even more so you would have like a clipped ceiling at your exterior wall situations? Absolutely. We're, we're definitely going to continue to work on the interior volume space in order to keep the addition um, height, addition height in relationship to the cockpit height as low as possible, but also giving sufficient interior headroom in there so at previous the previous project had a nine foot mm -hmm. ceiling height so we're bringing that definitely bringing that down and we will work with the interior volume and how we can fit mechanical up in into the ceiling mm -hmm. yeah, I think that'd be one of the, uh, the, the big battles uh, you know how to get uh, 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 something through such a low ceiling sort mm -hmm. of a situation yeah uh, you know short of stick framing it that being one of the options, but um, that re that all remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. That's all I have at this point in time. Mr. Taylor? My question was asked. <laughs> Mr. Myers, any questions? I am, uh, I think, less troubled by the height of this uh, addition because it sits so far back. Okay. Um, and it's a, I think that you've done a very good job. I think it almost overwhelms the existing house because, it, it, because the existing house was really a pretty modest dwelling. And mm -hmm. it's already been added on to. Mm -hmm. But I think you've done a good job in, in doing that. Um, so I'm not going to complain. Thank you. <laughs> no questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi. Um, hey. Could you put back up the? Uh, uh, you had a photograph yes. that showed the foundations towards yes. the end of your presentation. You were discussing closed foundation versus open foundation. I just wanted to see what those photographs said again because they were up and taken away real fast. There we go. Okay, so th there's there's t the the bottom left photograph shows an open vented foundation. Yes, I, I assume that that's access to the crawl space. Okay, and the other two are the original house. They're all that's they're the all origi the original house. Original so house in different locations. This I believe is the west. That is the east side of the house right by the mechanical right by the air conditioning mm -hmm. okay um i guess i would wonder is that original or was that actually cut open in order to install that mechanical unit at some point in time and that's the only access that was available and was that 
maybe done fairly recently and it's not historic at all? I'm going to assume from my experience with historic homes that the crawl space was usually open or there was um, some sort of, um, you know, covering. But um, I know from personal experience that insurance companies now do not want to have any openings in the crawl space underneath the home. And a personal experience with a coyote under <laughs> under my house. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm well familiar with that. But the fact that the rest of so the house. I think, I think what's going to happen here when we when we build the addition, there should be some access uh, when, for crawl space or access underneath the addition as per when we go to structural engineering. Um, so we would make the crawl space look exactly like it. it or not exactly, look. something close not to exact, that. Not exactly, something close to it. <laughs> Anything in the addition is not exactly Compl as the, Complimentary. Yes, <laughs> compatible. Compatible. Um, <laughs> Okay, I just I was just curious because yeah. I did glance and saw the vent. Yeah. But then you're right. The rest of the house is not. Yeah. You know, the rest of the house is a you know a full yeah. full solid stem wall. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, uh, I guess it's not a question, but the clip tip does definitely distinguish the addition from the existing, yeah. which is. That was definitely it's, an aha it's moment. It's my <laughs> pet peeve. It's one of my pet peeves, and, and that's 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 lovely. Um, the staff report tested, uh, touched upon windows on the east and the west side. Could you yes. show us the east and the west elevations? Um, just and, had those up. Yep. Yeah, and I just I'm trying to figure out what the what the concern was. So the concern was that these w double windows, if you can see, okay. I'm trying to get. Mm -hmm. Out a little bit. Okay. So and, th and that looks fine. Right. Would you consider on the top elevation, would you yeah. consider like a board down to the side or, you know, in oh, somewhere yeah. inset from the edge of the, s the end gable that extends out? Just like a full vertical oh, board. Oh, straight down. Straight yes. down that just kind of like yeah. creates that symmetry there to match what looks like correct. on the other side. That would look nice. There would be a board, mm -hmm. just a vertical board there mm -hmm. to break up Absolutely. that volume. Um, okay. Okay. No, otherwise I think, you know, there's, there, I know everything has been small and tweaked and pushed and pulled and I was the one also talking about the, the ceiling height and, and the roof height and mm -hmm. any way to bring that down. And my fellow commissioner brought up the fact that, you know, if, if the, the bearing plate height at the walls could be lowered mm -hmm. and then have an angled ceiling piece around the perimeter maybe until you get to the height that you want, the nine foot height, yeah. and keep it there. And that's another way of kind of like lowering the roof, but at the same time you're not impacting the volume feeling of being in those spaces mm -hmm. at all. Um, and it's kind of typical of, you know, second stories mm -hmm. where you have height issues, where you have a little bit of sloped roof and then you go to the full yep. height of the ceiling. Yes. Um, so, I mean, if you consider that, I think that's Absolutely. perfectly adequate. Um, I don't think I have anything else to, to ask. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank it, you. It's, a, it's a well tweaked Thank you. from the last <laughs> time. So if you can leave these up here. Um, okay. I actually, the east elevation, the lower one, you can, you can take the west one away, just leave the east one. And then if you could explain the choice of the two single windows on the one-story addition, the new ones. The space, if I go to the floor plan, usually have my assistant up here, and I told him I wasn't going to need him, but if you give me a moment. I'm not going to tell you what he's doing behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, the two windows. One window is going to be in the laundry room, mm -hmm. and the other window, so there's a shower here, and the other window is by the tub. Okay. 
Back to the elevation. Okay. Thank you. Um, it it doesn't concern me their actual placement. Mm -hmm. It's their sizes. Okay. So to to me, when I see this elevation, everything's happy, getting along, and then those two windows punch me in the eye. Okay. And it's because I feel like they're out of scale, mm -hmm. especially for it. that I see it now. little wall. Yeah. And. Um, I, I agree with all my fellow commissioners that this has just taken leaps and bounds since mm -hmm. the last time we saw this. Those are the last two things that are really okay. just giving <laughs> me concern. And I think, you know, that is something that can be worked out as okay. you move through. Um, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. Meaning, meaning you, you think they should be a different proportion? Yeah. I, I think that They're the size, wide. the proportion okay. to yeah. the the wall that they are residing in needs to be reconsidered. Okay. That is that is something you know I would ask some some more thought and refinement in that particular okay. area. One last thing from the um, okay. staff report is the gable vent. We I removed the gable. Did vent. you remove that? I did. Okay. All right. Well, obviously because you did the clip. Exactly. Makes sense to <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank um, you. Any other questions for the? Yes, if I may, please, ma'am. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, make a revisitation to the crawl space matter. Uh, this is more of a technical issue. Okay. Is the whole of the original construction on a crawl space? Oh, the the area on the side that had that was open. Is it a crawl space? Is it all crawl space underneath that house? I really do. I would assume so. Okay. Uh, yeah, so no, the these are the homeowners. Mr. Homeowner, how are you doing? Yes. <laughs> you you will need to provide your name. I'm Charles Benbasad, uh, co-homeowner with that. Could you spell that? Lovely and way. B N B A S S A T. Uh, so yeah, the whole original house is on a crawl space. Uh, Mr. Prokop, to your question, that side where you have that little thin access, there was a camphor tree that grew in there. It's one of the removed ones, I think, on the plan. And the root grew into the stem wall and cracked it. So it was all originally enclosed, but it had to be removed because it got, it got cracked and it's like pretty dense tree root. Uh, so that was my handiwork there. <laughs> no, 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 um, an the reason why I asked the question is that uh, typically um, the ground moisture issue uh, can become a very big problem uh, for a dwelling, a particularly a wood frame dwelling or a wood frame structure of any kind on a crawl space that is not adequately vented. And uh, this comes into two flavors here. One, for the existing structure, since you were doing so much work here, have you evaluated what that moisture impact is on the existing structure? And two, should you be evaluating that, that ventilation soil moisture situation for your addition and okay. the potential inclusion for additional vents. Excellent point. Well, boy, do I have the thing for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have personally spent like d tens of hours underneath that house uh, digging French drains, and we have a sump pump. Uh, so we have a full drainage system underneath the house that we could extend into the, the new space where the uh, new construction is going to go. So it's, it's drier under there than probably any other house in <laughs> Hyde Park. And, you know, but, you know, the moisture rises, your wood soaks it up, and, mm -hmm. you know, there is the potential for long-term maintenance issues. Uh, and all I'm ma making a point on is that, you know, would it be prudent in the appropriate locations to add some screen vents? Okay. We would definitely think about that and mm -hmm. add those vents and do an analysis of the ventilation on the foundation. Because I've been in some larger commercial structures that had basement conditions or yeah. crawl space conditions where that situation was no longer working 50, 70 years later because it's Florida, <laughs> it's wet here. Mm -hmm. you know, um, we don't have to have a completely open uh, uh, crawl space condition, which was typical of its era, uh, that appropriate venting might be a prudent thing to take a look at. Okay, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? No? You have, Mr. Prokop? No? Oh, okay. 
Um, you have five minutes for rebuttal if you have any. That you um, well, your points are very well taken, especially with the foundation being enclosed and a possible issue um, with keeping moisture out, and we'll definitely take that into consideration. Also, as I said, as we develop the plan with the structural engineer and refine the roof, we will keep um, the height of the addition as low as possible and exploring um, conventional framing and some different treatments on the inside with vaulted ceilings in order to create a larger volume space and also revisit the two windows on the east side uh, to make sure that they are of better proportion with that one-story addition. Weren't they on the west side? They were on the west side. Oh, I have that on my east side. Is it on the east? That's what I have on my drawings. It's the only one story. I may be mistaken. <laughs> Isn't it the... It's the west side. It is house. the Okay. It's the west side. I might have just <laughs> copied and pasted that one. <laughs> Wait a minute. I know that our all of our maps are always directed <laughs> to the north. Well, okay. <laughs> the west side. Yeah, that's I have it circled on my elevation. <laughs> They relabeled their elevation. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we'll go ahead and close the public portion of the hearing and move to discussion by the commissioners. Um, no, I think we've all made comments that it's just that the addition has been tweaked and pushed and pulled and, you know, squeezed and whatnot in, in the appropriate manner, you know, from our comments the last time you came before us. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's well done and it's, uh, I think it's, it's subservient. Even though it's taller, I think it's subservient to the main house. I agree and I think the detailing, yeah. adding in the, um, the clip tip, which I also know as the Dutch hip, mm -hmm. um, adding that element in, it, it really added another level of detail and you could see that the detailing changed in response to that so that was really nice and it became uh, more elegant and delicate at the same time mm -hmm. which was very nice and um, hopefully it's a better project for you and your clients so. <laughs> um, that's always our hope here is that um, whatever comments we might give and yeah. might ask for you to think about a little bit longer, it serves you and your clients. Right, so we're not making that project worse. That's <laughs> <laughs> Our goal is not to make the project That's worse, it's right. actually to make it better, and I think you... Exactly. Uh, I, think, I think this is better than it was the first time we saw it. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. I've said enough. <laughs> Anyone willing to entertain a motion at this time? I move to grant uh, a certificate of appropriateness for the drawings and documents presented at this public hearing in ARC 22-501 for the property at 1807 West Watrous Avenue in Tampa. Um, with the following conditions that the applicant revisit the proportions and scaling of the two windows on the west elevation of the property. <laughs> Um, and that the addition roof ridge height shall not increase from that presented this evening um, and if possible be um, minimized absolutely if possible um, because based on the finding of fact the proposed project is consistent with the uh, Hyde Park design guidelines and the city of Tampa for the following reasons that it uh, meets the provisions contained in chapter 27 of the city codes and that the volume detailing and proportions and scale of the addition are compatible with the design guidelines. I'd like to amend the motion. Um, in the west elevation, the two windows, mm -hmm. they're on the one story addition. I wanna just be very clear. Mm -hmm. That's what we're yes. directing. Okay, the two windows previously mentioned are on the one story addition. Thank you. I have a second, please? I'll second that motion. Before we vote on that, do you do understand the conditions set forth tonight? Absolutely. Okay, 
We'll go ahead and vote. All in favor, please state aye and raise your hand with the cane still. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank and you good very luck much. with everything. Thank you. And the last piece of business before I hit the gavel is there was some discussion by Mr. Fernandez that we make a motion to enter all the documents that were brought forth in the hearing tonight. So do we need to be more specific about that or just in a general? A motion to receive and file the report that was presented by Mr. Fernandez and is a part of your backup. Okay. Do we also need to include what Mr. Michelini introduced? Yes. Because that had not been given to us prior. Yes, please. Okay. Do we have a motion? And we can put that in one motion. Yes, that can be one motion. Do we have a motion? I move that we commit to tonight's hearing file documents presented by staff as well as documents uh, presented by uh, the applicant, Mr. Michelini as presented. And a second. I second that. All in favor, please state aye. 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 Motion carries. And we are adjourned. Thank you.